All right. So the question sometimes comes up, uh, you know, actually more often than you might think. You know, a lot of times uh, engineers are brought in after a problem is known about, right? So we're not always doing things from the design end. Sometimes we're doing things from an end that might be more like damage control, okay? And so there are cases where you might actually be brought in and, and you know, maybe a company knows that they have been misusing a machine for a certain period of time and overstressing a part for a certain period of time and they become aware of it before that part breaks. Okay, and so then they wanna know, do we need to replace that part or is there something that we can, you know, can we keep using it? Is it safe, right? And uh, that, that's kind of a big question. I'm gonna show you a little sliver of some stuff that's kind of like that today. And it's with this idea that's known as accumulated damage. And we're gonna look at one specific uh, type of way to deal with, with uh, this idea of accumulated damage. The idea here is that um, you are loading a part or assembly such that it is uh, loaded above the level that it can take for infinite life. So it has a finite life and you become aware that it has run for a certain number of cycles at this level where it's, it's being loaded more than it can take to be able to last infinitely, all right? And the question is, how much damage have you done? All right, and so uh, we're gonna introduce this um, idea of D. You can treat D like a percentage, right? If you have 100% of the damage it can take, that means you expect it's gonna break at any point right? Um, if you only have like 10%, like if D is 0.1, then you can kind of say, well, you know, only 10% of the total damage that it can take uh, has, has happened. One way to interpret this physically is that uh, the, uh, the phenomena of fatigue involves there being little defects in the material that as you stress the material, it starts to uh, cause little tiny bits of plastic deformation at these defects and it makes the defects worse, right? That's one way that we can think about what is really happening with uh, fatigue type of uh, scenario. And so what we're saying there basically is that this accumulated damage means that that process has gone forward some amount, right? Where it used to have only small defects, now it has bigger defects, or those defects have become more uh, concentrated uh, wherever they occur. And so this, uh, this rule that I have written right here, this has a name. This is Miner's Rule. And Miner's Rule says that uh, if you want to know the accumulated damage, what you have to do is you have to look at the different kinds of stress uh, waves, I'm going to call them, that have been applied to the part. You know, when I say waves, I basically mean some sort of a cyclic stress that has happened over a period of time and you look at the different types of waves that have been applied to something and each one of those waves we can evaluate how much it has contributed to the overall damage based on uh, a fraction of the number of cycles that would cause failure at that stress level right so you look at lowercase n is a number of cycles that you do at a particular load level what you're doing is taking that divided by the number of cycles that would, it would take to fail the part at that load level, okay? So let me give you some examples or some, some rough ideas of how this might happen. What, would, what about if we had a, uh, a part and over time, okay, let's say that this part has a fully corrected endurance limit that's right here. Okay, and I begin to load this thing with a wave that does something like this. Okay, and I do that for a certain number of cycles. And then maybe I turn up the intensity of the machine or something like that, and, I, and I, so I start getting a wave that maybe looks like this for a certain number of cycles. Okay, so what I mean by this expression right here is that uh, the number of cycles that I actually ran it at a particular level, this would be a lowercase n. 
right? And I would compare that number in a fraction relative to the number of cycles that I should be able to run the machine at that stress level before it breaks, okay? So this would be like n sub one, then it changes to another kind of wave, and I would have to call that like n sub two, and this could happen for any number of amounts of stress. So if you know some history about what has happened to the machine, right, that's, that is generating these stress waves, you might be able to evaluate how much damage has occurred, okay? What would happen then if, if all this went on and then we, we uh, transitioned into a very low stress, something like this? Now what? You're kind of okay again, as long as you haven't inflicted enough damage uh, to where it's, it's going to fail due to the things that have happened up to that point. Now you're back within the range where you might expect that it'd be okay, right? You're lower now than the uh, endurance limit, okay? So there's one, uh, there's one idea. Here's another way that this same type of idea can happen, but it's, it's one that we may not think of right away. What if a machine is set up such that the stress experienced at your critical location of your part looks more like this? What if you have, again, let's see, I'll set up my uh, endurance limit. This time I'll put it right here. And what about for this one? Uh, we have a wave that's really large, and then due to how the machine operates, there's a few smaller waves. And then there's a big wave again. How do you deal with this? Okay. Let me ask you this, logically, is this really any different than what I described up here where we did it one stress level for a while, then we do it another stress level for a while, and then we do a third stress level for a while? Is this different fundamentally from that? Okay. It's, it might be slightly debatable, but most people sort of look at this and go, no, that seems like it's pretty much the same thing. It's just when did we do the damage, right? Did we do the damage, um, you know, with a whole bunch at a large level for a while and then a smaller level for a while? Uh, or did we kind of intersperse them, right? Um, and so that's, uh, this is generally one of the assumptions we make here is that if you see a stress wave like this, you can kind of split it up into pieces as well and say, all right, you count the number of these peaks, right? And you have that number of those big stress cycles and you count the number of these peaks and you have a certain number of those cycles and you can add up your uh, different damages in the same way as we did in the first case, okay? Does this kind of make sense? Um, I've decided to forego talking about the different ways of counting cycles. Um, I don't know how useful it is right here. Let me just say this. Uh, there is no settled science on how it is done. Okay, the, there are several different ways that are out there for if you have a, let's say you have a completely chaotic stress wave, right? So you have like a wave that's really high and then it goes low. And you know, in some cases there might even be machinery where they have recorded all of that data over the time that it has been used, right? You, it's almost like putting a microphone on something and you, and you see this, uh, you know, wave versus time of the stress that might occur in something. You know, uh, how you count something as a cycle versus not is not a simple uh, task always. For instance, what if this, what if I saw a wave that did this? And then when it got up to the top, it, fluctuated a little bit and then came back down and then went up to the top and fluctuated a little bit. How do you count that? Yeah, do you, do you count those little cycles or not? All right, I mean, these, these are big questions or, you know, what if you had a, a situation where you had a big cycle and then, you know, something like this 
and then it goes back down. You know, it's not trivial figuring out what everything, you know, what all these things count as cycles and then how to account for them in a thing like uh, miner's rule. But miner's rule is fairly straightforward as long as we have something that's sort of simple like the first two examples that I'm showing you here. Okay, and so that's going to be kind of what I ask you about. It's going to be limited to that kind of, you know, one of those kinds of uh, stress waves. Fair enough? We ready to work on an example? All right. So here's our example. Let's say that we have a piece of material and we're not told exactly how it is being loaded, whether it's a cantilever sticking out or whether it's a pressure vessel or whatever. Let's just say that we somehow know that the stress that's being experienced in the part is given, and this is at the you know, critical location, the, uh, the stress that's being experienced in the part uh, is occurring according to the wave that's on the left. So it comes from a uh, value of 70 KSI, goes down to a value of negative 20 KSI, goes up to 40, goes down to negative 5, and then repeats back up to 70. Right? So that keeps on repeating. 70 down to 20, to 40, to negative 5, to 70, negative 20, 40, negative 5, 70. That keeps on going. And it does this for 100,000 cycles. Okay? So let's say it does that for a while, and then after that, um, maybe someone, maybe it wasn't supposed to experience that stress profile. Someone fixes something, and it goes to a stress profile more like it maybe was supposed to. I don't know. But let's say the same piece of material then, after having experienced this, it transitions into this case where it goes up and down between 50 and negative 50 in a fully reversed stress. And what we want to do is two things. We want to figure out what the accumulated damage is of uh, the first loading scenario, okay, after the 100,000 cycles. And we're going to have to use something to convert from our mid-range and alternating that we actually have into a, uh, an equivalent fully reversed. And so to do that, we're going to use Gerber. All right. And then for part B, uh, we're going to figure out after it has experienced the damage from that first set of cycles, um, let's say after that we, we're loading it with this plus and minus 50 KSI, um, how many more cycles can it experience or will it experience before it fails? Okay. Down here? Yeah, yeah that's negative 5 KSI. Okay, so let's say this material that we're working with um, has a, an ultimate strength of 120 KSI, and so that it'll help us save a little bit of time here. Let's say that we've been given all the information that we need to know about the material to be able to find a fully corrected endurance limit, and so let's say that that's 40 KSI. All right, so what do we do first? Okay. Well, I, I still have a label on here that I, I think I meant to erase it, but it kind of gives us a clue as to where we might start. Basically, I'm going to split the uh, wave on the left into what I'm going to call cycle one and cycle two. Okay. And we're going to treat those as if they're sort of happening separately, right? How many of cycle ones are there? Uh, per number of cycle twos. Okay, they're just one to one. So however many of cycle one happen, it's the same as cycle two, and so we can say that there's been 100,000 of each of those. All right, so we're going to use that to figure out how much damage has occurred. All right, and so uh, I guess actually the first thing that we need to do is to determine uh, what are the mid-range and alternating stresses for each of these cycles? Okay, starting with cycle one.
Okay, so for cycle one, um, it basically is this outer cycle. Actually, the cycle one is, you can kind of think of it as having peaks that go to the complete outside. Okay, and uh, so that means that we have a maximum of 70 KSI. I'm going to do alternating first. We have a max of 70 KSI minus a minus 20 KSI over 2 gives us 45 KSI. Okay. And our mid-range stress is going to be equal to 70 KSI plus a minus 20 KSI over 2, which gives us just 25 KSI. All right. Um, at this point, I have enough information to where if I wanted to, I could solve for a factor of safety. Okay. How would I do that? Okay. Gerber, the Gerber criteria is given on page. If you look at the bottom of page 315, table 6-7, there is a nicely encapsulated formula that gives you a factor of safety using Gerber. What, um, what variables do we need for that? Ultimate strength, mid-range stress, alternating stress, and endurance limit. We have all of that. So what I'm going to say is uh, I don't want to spend my time actually calculating the factor of safety here. If I were to do that, the factor of safety would turn out less than one. Okay, so that's always something you can check at the front end to say, is my factor of safety um, greater than or less than one? If it's less than one, then you would predict less than infinite life, right? And so that means you have to go into uh, figuring out how many cycles it would last, which means we do what we just did for that last problem. So the Gerber uh, formula, which is on page 314. The Gerber formula is equation 642. All right, it says that SA over SE, but we're now dealing with a situation where we don't have infinite life, so what do we replace SE with? SF. Plus SM over SUT squared equals 1, okay? And so we'll do what we did last time. We'll basically say SA over SF um, is equal to 1 minus SM over SUT squared. And this tells me that SF is going to be equal to um, SA over 1 minus SM over SUT squared. All right, so what do I plug in? I plug in my alternating stress, 45 KSI. Okay, I plug in uh, my mid-range stress of 25 KSI. My ultimate strength of, what was it, 120 KSI. And what I calculate there is an equivalent fully reversed load, right, or fully reversed stress. This is what we basically are finding with this SF. It's going to be equal to 47 
KSI. Okay, well, once I have that, um, I can plug it into the equation we used before to find <coughs> N. Okay, what do I need to be able to do that? I need F in order to find A and B. Okay, so again, we have an ultimate strength of 100 KSI, or excuse me, not 100, 120 KSI. SF came out to be 47. 47, yep, 47 KSI. Look how beautiful that one works out. Nice. Point 0.82. All right. So I take that and I plug it into equation 614. Okay, equation 614 says that A is going to be equal to F, which is 0.82, uh, times S sub UT, which is 120 KSI. And actually, the parentheses go around that whole expression. And then S sub E, which I forgot what that was, 40 KSI. All right, so what I have for A there is 242.1 KSI. For B, it is going to be equal to one-third, or negative one-third, rather, the log of F times S sub UT. over SE. Alrighty, and uh, what I get for that is negative 0.1303. Oh, negative. Alrighty, so there's A and B, and so how do I find N? N is going to be equal to 47 KSI over A. To the 1 over B. Okay, and that, these, by the way, are expressions uh, 614, 615, and 616. When we punch that in, we get that uh, at that stress, or that, those levels of stress, those peak levels of stress at high and low, you know, the, the 70 to negative 20, uh, we should be able to last 288,100 cycles. Accumulated damage is that factor of D that I put way up at the beginning. Okay which means I need to use Miner's Rule. So that might be a good idea to go ahead and remind ourselves of Miner's Rule. Miner's Rule says that D is equal to the sum of N sub I over capital N sub I, where I covers all the different types of waves that you have. So for our problem, for at least for this first half of this problem, we have two kinds of waves, right? which I'm calling cycle one and cycle two. So this is, this here is Miner's rule. So you did parts A and B under cycle one, and now we're about to do parts A and B under cycle two. 
No, I did, when you're saying part A and B, I'm partially way through uh, part A right now. We have not yet found the accumulated damage using Gerber. What we just found is one denominator. We found one of these N's, capital N's. Okay, so basically for us, ours is going to be D is equal to N sub 1 over N sub 1 plus N sub 2 over N sub 2 because we have two different kinds of waves that we're dealing with in that first set of cycles, that first 100,000 cycles. What we just found was N1. Does that help us a little bit? All right, let's now find N2. Okay, N2 is based on this level of 40 KSI and a level of negative 5 KSI. Okay, tell you what, I'm going to slide all of this down. So this will be for cycle two. First, I need to find my alternating stress. Okay, my alternating stress is going to be equal to 40 KSI minus a minus 5 KSI over 2, uh, which gives me 22 and a half KSI. For my mid-range, it's going to be 40 KSI plus a minus 5 KSI over 2, which gives me 17 and a half KSI. All right. So what we can do there, if we recall the uh, expression that we came up with down here, we'll use that again. Okay, what do we need to plug in? Twenty two point five KSI over one minus seventeen point five KSI over S sub U T, which was one hundred and twenty KSI, that squared. All right. I guess I actually don't have this in my notes. I better compute it. 22.5 divided by 1 minus uh, 17.5 over 120. That squared. So 22.99. Okay, this is a little bit interesting. Let's think about this in terms of our mid-range and alternating uh, stresses. What does our uh, Gerber criteria look like here? Down here we have 120 KSI for our mid-range. Up here on our alternating, where do we expect us to no longer have infinite life on that axis? 40 KSI. Okay. Where did we just find SF? So what does that mean? It 
should be able to last an infinite number of cycles at that stress level. Okay. Because it's lower than the fully corrected endurance limit. Yes, sir. Because remember, um, S sub E is a special case of S sub F. All right, S sub F presumes that you have a fully reversed type load. Okay, S, that's a fatigue strength, and it presumes a fatigue strength in a fully reversed type of a way. All of our criteria, our Gerber, ASME, or Goodman, all of those are designed to convert basically from other kinds of stress uh, you know, maxes and mins to the equivalent uh, fully reversed, all right? And so um, whenever you're straight up on the vertical axis of the mid-range and alternating stress uh, axes, that means you are uh, basically a fully reversed type of a load, right? You can always convert back up to that. That's what we did with this equation is we converted to something that would be an equivalent fully reversed load and we, when we compare that against the uh, endurance limit, it's lower, and so that means we would predict infinite life. Okay, so this, okay, whereas the N1 we found here a second ago, yeah, that's, that's N1. All right, so how much damage have we done? Okay, for our accumulated damage, uh, D is going to be equal to uh, 100,000 over 288,100 plus 100,000 over A lot, a lot, a lot, okay? Which means that didn't have an effect. And so what we end up with there for our D factor is going to be 0.347. And now, we have answered part A. Yeah, right, that's, that's what this means. Is it repeated this for 100,000 cycles, right? And then um, now we're ready to start part B of this problem, okay? So what we're saying here is that we've accumulated you know, one way of interpreting this is that we've had basically 34.7% of the damage that it should be able to take before it breaks. So how much damage do we have left? Okay. One minus D. Right, 100% minus 34.7%. That's what we've got left. So what we basically need to do now is figure out for our next phase where we go from negative 50 to positive 50, back and forth over and over again, that is already a fully reversed stress, right? So what number of cycles should it be able to take for that? That's easy, we go back to 616 again Only this time, there's not really anything that we need to do um, to find the parameters that are there. N is just going to be equal to that 50 KSI for our fully reversed uh, stress. Okay, what value did we have for A down here? Way down here. A is going to be 242.1 KSI. Okay. 
and this will be raised to the 1 over b. b was negative 0 0.1303. All right, and this number of cycles is 118,100. I'll show you that right now. We needed to know this so that we could go in and, um, you know, let me, let me put it this way. Um, we could have written our accumulated damage uh, with all of these terms, right? Where we basically had our accumulated damage, D, is going to be equal to 100,000 over 288, 100, plus 100,000 over, a mil or over uh, infinite, plus some n that we can run it for, n3, let's say, over 118,100. And in this case, if we're saying, how long can we run it until it, we think it's going to break, what's the value of d at that point? Okay, so one way of doing it is go back to the very beginning and write this equation. The other way you can do it is recognize that how much damage we have left over is uh, d, or excuse me, 1 minus d. That's how much damage we, we have remaining to work with. If you take 1 minus d, Okay, then that would be a different D than this one up here. That would be very confusing. This, this D is the D we calculated from before, whereas this D up here we're saying has to be equal to 1. So I should, maybe I'll just erase that. That'll make it make better sense. Okay. 1 minus D then is equal to N3 over 118,100 uh, cycles. And then you put in for D the value that we had before, which was 0.347, right? Yeah. And solve for N3. So N3 Hey, <laughs> sorry, I looked at the wrong number earlier. This is what we come out with here. I, I just read the wrong number off of my notes here. This is supposed to be 180, uh, 838. That's the trouble with not doing the, pr the problem as you go along. So that would be down here. And when you solve for N3, that becomes 118. One hundred. Okay. Both of these say the same thing, right? Whether you do it uh, according to um, like going all the way back to the beginning and then putting in that number as a variable, or uh, once you've calculated your damage up to that point, take 100% minus that and, and calculate for N3. Same thing either way. That should be as clear as mud now, right? Anyone have questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, so you're basically saying here, um, assuming the material's properties are unchanged by the first 100,000 cycles, um, let's put it this way. 
that is essentially what we are doing by saying that it has been damaged a certain amount, right? So we wouldn't want to go back in and also try to account for it another way as well. It's not that that kind of an idea couldn't be done. You know, you, you might be able to go in there and try to reassess what its new strength properties are, uh, but uh, instead we're just doing it using this miner's rule, which miner's rule to find things like A and B, for instance, you don't go back and recompute what your ultimate strength values are and that kind of thing to find your A and B. And that's why that, I put that statement in there. Yes, sir? Okay, so basically what I have here is that um, this, this case right here has one large wave uh, going from peak to peak to, you know, this outer wave, and inside of there we have this inner wave. And um, that was actually the, uh, the piece that I said I wasn't going to talk about a whole lot um, because I basically showed you a couple of different examples up here where you could embed a few uh, small waves along with some big waves. Um, and, you know, I guess what I'll probably say about that is um, there is a technique that's called the rain flow method. Um, and it basically is, imagine taking these curves and setting them up to where they're vertical. And imagine that you had some sort of uh, water that was kind of set up on top of all the surfaces. So let's say, you know, I'll do that for this. Let's say you have something that's like this, right? Imagine that you start out where there's just little water droplets beat up, beaded up everywhere on the surfaces of this thing. And you look at where does this water drip off, right? All of this water drips off here. This water drips off here, right? This water drips off here, so on and so forth. And what you do um, is you start looking at um, where these water droplets would have dripped off. And that's one of the ways that you can establish where are your outer limits, right? And that's that idea of the rain flow counting method um, is more or less what I'm doing here. Um, even though I didn't really put a name to it. I know that probably doesn't help a whole lot to answer your question. And, and the problem is the, the answer to that question is really, really complicated. And so I'm going to kick that can down the road just a little bit until, you know, some of you might be in a situation where you have uh, very proprietary methods even, perhaps at your places of employment where you deal with this question maybe, right? Um, but this is one way of, of looking at it. Other questions? Well, thank you for your attention, and I will see you guys on Wednesday for our last lecture. <laughs>